stumbled over the steps following Romulus and looking down at the more innate mosaic designs on the walls around them. Romulus's expression changed to anger suddenly, as his moods were as quick to change as the switchbacks. She felt she could read his mind. He was thinking of Lupina, the influence she seemed to have over his life. Lade knew the feelings of obligation towards her that had held her back for so long. All that, and Mom didn't even treat her fairly. Why did she have to side with Ashley over her own daughter? Why couldn't she be on Lane's side for once? Lane kept pushing, stomping, and putting every ounce of her sheep body into the mountainside like it was the mountain's fault. The whole time, all she could think of was that damn lazy Susan at Mom's house and how a can always got stuck behind it. She started to work her way into a deep trench of bitterness and all of a sudden she realized that she was alone, pressing almost unconsciously into the side of the mountain which became the Lazy Susan. It was like the revolving door of canned goods. And she was in mom's kitchen, a high schooler again, just back from cross country practice scouring the cupboards for food. As societies advanced and technology upgraded, part of the natural rhythm was lost and people forgot how to talk to animals, find balance, and trust their own instincts. Lane was reaching to pull out the lodged can when mom came through the back from her bedroom. She usually woke up from working the night shift around the time Lane got done with practice and then had to go to work again. Ashley keeps eating all our food, Lane said. Make some spaghetti, Mom said. A few months before Grandma Arlene died, Lane's Wyoming grandma, and Mom got released from her teaching job for not signing her papers on time. It seems she was already disliked by members of the school board, whose creationism preferences brought controversy to their small town. Mom had already invited Ashley to live with them before all this happened. Lane had no say and Mom made Lane go to high school in the next town, Hamilton, while Ashley stayed in Darby. Their other best friend, Holly, moved to the Pine Hills Reservation, breaking up the trio, and Ashley never hung out with Lane much anyway, preferring the foreign exchange student, the two of them going off to the gym right to bear arms, owned by the bodybuilding lady, or getting ready, putting on way too much makeup. Mom worked nights at the children's home, so she usually woke up when Lane got home from school, catching a ride back with the other commuter families. Hey, do you know Max? Mom asked. He goes to Corvallis. Yeah, I think I met him last summer, Lane said working in housekeeping. Why? Oh, he's living at the sea home, Mom said. He just mentioned that you might know each other. Lane didn't really care. She had other things going on. This spaghetti's so plain. Is there anything I can add to it? Lane was a picky eater and preferred kale, but Mom liked the quick, easy microwave meals that Lane did not think were healthy. Just eat it, Mom yelled, slamming the door to her room, like she did when she first heard the news about Grandma. Mom stayed in there for what felt like days, and when she finally came out, she said, Our mom loved us, she just didn't protect us. Lane didn't understand. She was concerned with cross-country, her assignments, college essays, signing up for school's free lunches, and the fact that dad wasn't there. 
Sometimes mom put Lane down, pointing out her flat chest or calling her anorexic. And sometimes she raised her up saying she was sweet and kind, like Audrey Hepburn and Sabrina. It was an inconsistent love, but probably better than her mom had given her. When Lane opened her eyes, she started bleeding. She realized she never entered the kitchen at all, but was beating her head against the rock wall. That's the only good resentment did. It was like beating one's head against the wall. The words of the guided meditation she often listened to rang in her ears. Imagine the love of the perfect parent as they greet you from school, the joy in their eyes as they see you, the solid hug, their readiness to listen, the food on the table waiting for you, clean laundry, new clothes. See yourself totally at rest, enjoying the love of a parent who loves you perfectly, who doesn't demand anything from you, who isn't too busy. You are completely safe here held by a parent who sings over you with joy. Lane stepped out from behind a bush. I'm glad you got that out of your system, Romula said. He was sitting on one of the steps waiting for her. His bitter expression had turned into something open and pensive. Even in the dark, his lantern showed shapes and patterns emerging and the steps ever closer, signaling that they were getting closer. Etched in the steps, the images of ships, sea creatures, and animals. Some scenes showed exotic animals like tigers. She knew from her research that exotic animals were shipped in from distant lands to Emain Maka, the mythological seat of the king and queen of Ulster in ancient Ireland. Maybe because they were unique and beautiful, when seen out of their homeland. She couldn't believe he hadn't planned this trek to Mount Alba just as the Latin festival was commencing. How perfect the timing was. Lane anticipated the grasping glorious sunlight on that fresh skin of the land. It came to her like an omen. If you walk up the rocky cliffs, you can see the sunlight. The truth shines like the sun. The truth burns like a fire that will never go out. She heard cheering and music from the Latin festival as she turned the final switch back. A bald, flat rock surface came into view where a crowd emerged from beyond two umbrella pines and the whole festivity could be seen with the outline of the palace just behind it. It smelled like flower bushes in bloom. The flat cliff where everyone danced seemed to take up the whole cliff. It was like the carnival dad had been unable to take her to that time. She'd bit the skin off her lip in anticipation to have him never show up. But what she imagined had been better she turned and plunged into the densest part of the crowd, pulling her in like one of those tilt-a-whirls at the county fair, and she felt her time growing closer as the momentum built into a fine frenzy. She thought she must know how Romulus felt to have something he'd worked so hard for and loved so dearly and could not give up on. She was excited to see who she was, who she actually was, when the heaviness of her existence became as immeasurably light as a cobweb in the wind. Her wheel of fortune opening a new cycle, all levels completed. That's what it felt like anyway, even if the outside didn't yet match her insides. From events that seemed almost predestined before, now she knew every closed door had led her to this new arena of beauty. If mom hadn't made her go to the new school, she probably wouldn't have received the scholarships to go to college. If she had the perfect parents, she'd never be pushed to leave her comfort zone to define her own life and values. To confront her truth. 
Plus, having the perfect parents would just be plain weird. She ducked around the corner to the blacksmith stall and peered between the gleaming clay pots. In the crowd standing before the dais, she saw ankles, calves, and hanging rags. She was engrossed in the music of the lyre. Lane looked up as much as her neck would crane and saw the sky lit with stars. Her eyesight, hearing, and sense of smell ripened to the roasting smell of apples, fish, and boiled meat, making her eyes water. In my video, guys, I'll be back with another video next Wednesday. Till then, ciao!